Well, welcome to the Rectory Garden. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna now spend a, a few minutes just hearing from Steve and Gillian. Um, I've got a few questions for them. And I just thought it'd be, it'd be good just to start by asking Steve and Gillian a little bit about the story about how they came to Morton. Maybe they could just walk us through. Um, Steve or Gillian, how, how did you end up here in Morton 24 years ago? Well, we've been in uh, London for about eight years, or at least I've been there for eight years and Gillian had joined me for the last three. And we knew it was time to leave, but we couldn't find a place to go to. Uh, we looked at various things and none of them seemed right. And we got a phone call one day from Douglas Scott, actually, uh, saying that there was, uh, the church in Morton was looking for somebody, would we be interested? And we didn't have anything else on the cars at the time, so we thought, well, okay, we'll give it a go. We came down here, it was a glorious, sunny summer day. Mm. Um, the Cotswold looked at its finest, and understandably, we could see some of the attractions of coming to a place like this. And so we said we'd come, and we met some of the people there, and almost the first people we met were Barry and Margaret Peaston. We, we had a meeting at one of the church wardens' houses, and we followed their car in, and we saw a fish on the back of it. I remember thinking, oh, that's good, there's somebody, you know, real live faith here. Um, and we met the people, and the, the lovely thing was that we said to them, what are you looking for in their new vicar? And we, we'd asked this of a few people before, other churches we'd gone to, and they'd come with a whole list of things that they wanted. And they just said two things. They said, we want someone to come and teach us, and we want someone to come and lead us. I remember thinking, I think I just about handle that. And I, from that moment onwards, I think we felt, yeah, this was the place to come. Um Yes, I, and I think when Steve first mentioned Morton in Marsh, I'd been at work and he came back and told me, and I, I in my ignorance, had to even come and look it up on a map. I had no idea um, what it was, where it was, um, and I've, I was brought up in London, so it seemed a very big move. But I think that first meeting, I could see a swimming pool in someone's garden. I was nearly eight months pregnant, um, and the thought of just jumping in there was very appealing. Um, and I think the people and the settings won me over, and I thought, oh, maybe I can do this. So you, um, you applied and, and wonderfully you were, you were given the post and I guess a few months later you were able to come and be inducted. I'd just love to hear a little bit about, about your, those early months. What, what was it like when you first arrived? Um, so having come down in the summer, we arrived in January and I think it might even have been snowing, I'm not sure. So a very different feel. Um, but I think my first impression really of the church was a lot smaller than I was used to. Um, very different from what I was used to, but always very friendly welcome, and that was all the churches and their benefits. The people were really warm and really welcoming, um, and I think they made it very easy to adapt to a very different situation. I came with a little baby, that's always an icebreaker. So I think for me it was a, an easier transition than I ever had, had anticipated. I remember the first time uh, we went into St David's, we. I think we were just being shown around and we went in. It's funny, before you go into a church, you've got no idea what it's going to be like. And you judge on a few things, you know, the books that are out and how colourful it looks and so on. And I remember the feeling of colour, I think the, the kind of the kneelers were up and there were chairs everywhere. They were desperately uncomfortable, but they were chairs. Um, and it, it did feel warm and welcoming. Uh, the first service, of course, we went to was my induction. And that always can fool anybody because it's a place is packed out, about 250 people there. Well, we didn't see 250 people for quite a long time after that, but it still felt full, and there, there was a real warm welcome. And what you were very, what I was very conscious of, I think we were both very conscious of, was there was a group of people who'd been uh, praying for St David's and mm. praying for Morton, praying for the North Cotswolds, that God would do something, God would bring people. Um, I, I think a lot of people kind of felt it was somewhere you might come to just before you retire, um, and, and we felt when we came here that there was real potential and meeting people and working out the people who'd been praying and people who'd been in the background but really longing for something to happen was an amazing encouragement early on. And I think that, that took us through the times when it was, it was very different from what we knew in London. We'd gone from a congregation of over a thousand to a congregation of about 60 or 70. So it was very different, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we were encouraged by it. So that was, that was 24 years ago. Um, there's been a lot of water and a lot of bridges since then. What, what, are the, what are the strongest memories for you as you look back at how God has been at work here in Morton? I can't remember how long we've been here, but fairly soon after we came, we set up a, a Bible study group and we had about eight or ten people who came, some of whom had been part of a Bible study group before. And after two years, we ran a sort of alpha course. It wasn't alpha, it was a sort of bit of a compilation. Uh, we called it That's Life, I think, wasn't yeah. it? It's called That's Life. And we had about, I should say, about 60 or 70 people in the church who came over the first two times we did it. Um, and I think a lot of 
the people now or the people over the years who've been at the centre of the church were part of that. And that was, that, was a, that was a really vivid memory. We did it in the Reedsdale Hall because we didn't have any other premises at the time. Um, but we had a great time. And I, I look back on that as a, as a really key moment. And I suppose the second uh, one that I, I always remember is uh, MMO4, it was the first big mission that we did when Rico came and spoke. And we had, a, we had a, just a great time. We had hundreds of people uh, coming. We had a tent for about 500 and for the final service, we filled it. Admittedly, there were a lot of other churches who joined us because of that state. There wasn't really much going on in some of the other churches. But I just remember coming from Longborough, where we had a service with Rico, down to St. David's. We had a big marquee up on the school playing field. And just walking down to the, 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 play, the, 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 the marquee and just seeing hordes of people pouring in. Um, and someone said to me, said, it's like revival. Well, it wasn't quite, but it was so encouraging. It was just wonderful to see it. And I think that will always remain a very special memory, that, that, that mission in 2004. But it was the first of our missions, and so many people came. It was just a great encouragement. Yeah, I think, I think definitely Aubrey, that's a very big memory for both of us. It was a, a big crowd and lots going on, so that was fun. Um, and Steve mentioned groups. We've had some wonderful home groups over the years as well. I remember one particularly. Um, mostly new Christians, very different people from all sorts of backgrounds, a real mix of ages. And I think that was a very precious group to us, wasn't it? It was sad when we had to feed them into other home groups and start again, but that was lovely. Um, and personally, I guess, um, memories of having two more children here. We came with one, we had two more. Um, meeting lots of lovely friends um, through, the, through the children over the years. They're very precious memories too. We've just got so many, it's hard to pull out one or two really. <laughs> How, how, as you look back, how, what have been some of the surprises, the things that you just would never have seen coming? How, how has God surprised you over these years? It's difficult looking back because everything gets kind of concertinaed. You, you can't remember exactly the order in which things happened and how far apart they were. But the, the, the first stage of our building project when we did the inside of the church and we bought the centre, that was a big thing. Uh, and we, we prepared for that for quite a long time and we raised money for it and we and it was a wonderful provision of God's mercy in that, and we were really delighted. But we always knew when we did it that that was only half the story, uh, that we had a center which was usable, but actually in a pretty grim state. And um, I mean, it couldn't continue like that. And at the same time, we'd already had one project, we'd already raised quite a lot of money, and the thought of going back to the congregation and saying, we're gonna raise some more money, I just hated the thought. And the strange thing is that in July of, I think it was the PCC in July of 2007, um, that at the PCC, I, I, told, I said to PCC, look, we're in this situation, we've got a new, a new building project, but I don't want to do it. I hate the thought of it. And I said, and I think these are my precise words, something's got to happen. And, and I was envisioning that stage, some benefactor giving us 200,000 quid or something like that. Well, three weeks later, Morton was flooded. And the center was basically not destroyed, but made a complete mess of. And I thought, well, that's the end of it. That, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And then I suddenly realized, or I think it was Margot, Margot Stansbury, who sort of pointed out, she said, actually, this is our opportunity. And she was absolutely right, because we'd already done some preliminary planning and put some plans together for the development of the center. Um, and so they were almost ready to go. They had to be readapted, obviously. Um, but it was extraordinary, because in 15 months, the whole thing had been put back together again with it just as new and all the money had been found now i having said god is going to have to do something pretty amazing i had never expected a flood to be the answer but it was it was just extraordinary really. looking back on it um that was amazing his provision for us in that way and and we couldn't really imagine now life at st david's without the center it's central to so much of what we do so whilst it's only a building it's it's a very special one for us yeah i think maybe one of the biggest surprises for me is possibly that we've been here for 24 years. I never, I never in my wildest dreams have thought that. I never thought Steve would retire from here. I thought we were coming here for a little season. Um, and maybe that's how I could come so easily. It just didn't seem to be very long in my head. And here we are 24 years later. And yeah, that is a surprise. So we're, we're coming to the end of your time here in Morton. If, if you could talk to the Steve and Gillian who are walking into the rectory for the first time and give them just some advice, like, what, what would you want to share with your younger selves? Huh? One of the things that happens when you become a vicar is that people give you all sorts of bits of advice. You know, do this or do that, or don't do this, don't do that. And somebody said to me at one stage, and it's probably often said, 
that most vicars overestimate what they can do in a year and un underestimate what they can do in five years. And I think one of the things that struck me is that as I look back now, the changes are enormous, but a lot of them were quite gradual. They didn't seem always enormous at the time. Um, and a lot of it's to do with patience, really, that actually if you wait long enough and, and, and not say push, but encourage people and teach people, actually in time, all sorts of change is possible. I was trying to think of an example of this earlier, and it's a, it's a tiny example, but I guess it's somewhat significant. We used to have, uh, for our communion in St. David's, wafers, which a lot of people in churches use, wafers. Um, and one or two people thought, well, wouldn't it be good to have bread? The prayer book actually says it should be bread as is commonly used. And we thought, yeah, that's a good idea. So we tried it, tried it out for a month. And some in the congregation were not happy. And actually somebody got up a petition and asked people to sign it. What they, did they want bread or did they want wafers? And inevitably enough, wafers won. Um, so we, we quietly shelled it. And then about three years later, somebody else said, why don't we have bread? So we thought, we'll give it another go. And that time nobody said a word, nobody, nobody seemed to mind. And it struck me that, I mean, it's a tiny little thing, but actually patience is, is, is a great thing in building a church and in developing a church. And you don't have to do everything straight away. Maybe there are one or two things that you think straight away you need to do. And for us, it was like doing a family service and, and having a morning service instead of all communions. We still had communions early and in lots of different places, but for our main service, not always having communion. Um, so that was one of the things that we brought in fairly soon, but a lot of things took a long time. But now, in some ways, it's, it's a lot different than it was. And I think, I'd say patience. You know, you can do, or through God, by His grace, more things are possible than you realize. Um, and I just think I'd add to that by saying, use the opportunities. It goes quicker than you ever think. Um, and you don't really want to waste them. It's very easy to let opportunities slip by and suddenly find that you've gone weeks and months without speaking to that person that you wanted to speak to. So just grasp the opportun opportunities when they come. We'd love to hear a little bit about how, how God has changed you. Like how, how maybe as you look back this, this experience of 24 years here has affected you. Um, maybe you could just share a little bit, as you've, as you've watched each other, how have you seen God at work um, in Steve or Gillian, respectively? Um, big question, Ben. Um, so we've been married about three years um, when we came. So most of our marriage has been out here. So I guess, yeah, that's the time we've seen the changes in each other. Um, and I think the thing that I have learned more and more about Steve I don't want to make his head too big, but he's actually very wise. Um, he does think before he speaks. Um, he doesn't fire off angry emails. He's taught me not to do that, um, and probably many other people. Um, he he's very, very gracious with people, even at times, and it's been very few occasions when people have not been so gracious to him. He has always been gracious back um, and very patient with them, and I might have been seething maybe in the background. And I just think that's a really good example of leadership that is he's wise and he's very gracious with people and incredibly patient with me. Um, as Gillian says, when we came here, uh, we'd only been married three years and I'd seen Gillian in action. She'd, she'd helped with a Christianity Explored or something equivalent in London, a group for a little bit. But we'd not really worked together, Christian-wise, until we came here. Um, one of the things I always loved about Gillian is that you can put her in any context and she'll be able to talk to people and make people feel at home. She's very, very good with people. And I think what I've seen over the years is just how she's been able to use that for the cause of the gospel, really. Um, I can't imagine anyone not liking her um, <laughs> because she just has this way with people and, and, and people trust her and people will tell her things. Um, and I think that, that side of the ministry has really, really come on hugely. Um, and yeah, she's, she's a great confidant. She doesn't break confidences. She never tells me things that I want her to tell me. Um, and I think a lot of people have come to rely on her for that way. And I think, I just think it's wonderful the way that has really developed over the years, that gift. You've, um, I mean, you've seen a lot of change here. It's going to be a big change you leaving. What would be, and what would be your, your hopes for the Morton Benefice going forwards? What do you think might be some of the challenges that we'll face, Steve? It's a difficult question, really. Um, 
I think one of the ways I've failed here is I'd love to have brought the different churches of the benefits closer together than they are. But over the last two or three years, I think that's really changed. Um, and we are working more and more together. I'd love to see us working together uh, for the cause of the gospel uh, and work out that some things are better done locally in villages in, in Morton and some things are better done centrally, maybe just here, and working out the balance between the two. The challenge for the Church of England is that we have so many church buildings. Um, we don't have enough clergy to go around. We have hundreds of PCCs. We have a lot of churches where they don't have two church wardens or they struggle to find a treasurer. And it's really difficult. And somehow we've got to work together to uh, reach the area for the gospel without being endlessly tied up in building regulations, in quinquennial surveys and things like that. I think, my, I think the benefits here is in a good position. Um, and I hope that it can give something of a lead, set something of an example to others. Um, but also that it will be increasingly strengthened to reach out in the area as a whole. Um, the gospel in this part of the country has gone much more out than it had done in the past, I think. It has been a huge change, but there are still hundreds, thousands of people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And wouldn't it be just wonderful to see us all working together to, to, to make that more and more a reality? So my longing would be that we never lose touch with the gospel, that we keep going even when it's a little bit, yeah, it can be discouraging, that we work together as much as we can um, and that we just seek to take the gospel out to the people around us. It's what people need more than anything else. So, for you as a family, this is a, this is a, this is a big change. And um, it'd, just be, not, it'd be lovely to hear a little bit about what might be in store and maybe what, what isn't yet clear as you look at your future. Well, it probably won't come as a surprise that we're not entirely clear what the future holds. Uh, we don't exactly know where we're going to live. We've got someone to live in the short term and we are thinking hard about a couple of houses that we may uh, try and buy, um, but we're not entirely sure yet. Uh, we'll be in Morton uh, for a few weeks after this, uh, here and there, coming and going, doing different things, trying to clear the house out, trying to leave in as good a state as possible. So we're not entirely, entirely sure, but we want to go to a place where there is a good church, where we can be a help in that church without being a hindrance. Uh, I don't want to sort of kind of impose myself on someone, but at the same time, if there's a, a role for us to fulfill, we'd love to do it. Take a few months kind of out of it, I think, just, just a little bit of a break before we get back involved. Um, so we're not entirely clear. Um, we, I think the diocese have allowed us until the end of August to be here. We don't want to take it right to the wire, uh, but <laughs> we will be around for a little bit. So I hope we'll see people over the next few weeks, you know, from time to time, so we won't be completely out of sight. So as you, um, as you approach this moment, of course, we're going to be praying for you, and, and I'm sure we'll be praying for you as a church family for months, years to come. We're not going to, yeah, this isn't going to be the end. We're, we're going to, you're going to stay very, very important to us and valued by us. Um, but how, how can we pray intelligently for you at this time? Um, obviously, as we don't quite know what our plans are, it'd be really good for those plans to become clear. So I'd really value prayer for that. Um, I'm trying my best to, to trust God. I know he's got it sorted. I just need to to get it sorted ourselves and know what it is. Um, and I think personally, it's, it's been a hard way to leave um, and it's gonna be very, very hard to leave anyway. So I think please pray that we're always gonna look back at Morton. That's not gonna be a, a problem. It's just been a special place. Um, so please pray that we will also look forward and not look back on this in a wrong way, but actually be excited for me and look forward to what comes next. That'd be, that'd be great if you could pray that for me. I like to do things in threes. So a house, um, well, obviously we're trying to find a house. Um, I think a church, we want to find a house near a church where we can be of real use and value and a role, you know, something to do within it. I don't want to just, just to sit back. I mean, Gillian's a lot younger than me. She's got lots of uh, energy left. I've got slightly less, but yeah, just I think a house, uh, a church and a role would be great. And for our family. Um, yeah. Our longing always for them is that they would walk with the Lord Jesus, so that they would keep faithful to him. That's our biggest longing, really. And we're so grateful for people in the church who prayed for them. Uh, I guess this side of eternity, we'll never know how much of a debt we owe to them, but we so, certainly do owe them a lot. And uh, so, you know, thank you for your prayers.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun. song. 